angel. We will listen to a priest, angel. Okay. Are you... What is your gender? Angel. 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 We're going to listen to a priest, okay? Okay. Okay. Here. Okay, okay. okay. You're in a hurry. Father Jonathan Meyer delivered an absolutely amazing talk at a Catholic men's conference on the sacrifice of the Mass, sharing the importance behind why we should go to Mass and the alarming huge percentage of Catholics that have no idea what the Mass is about. Good morning, gentlemen. Good. I'm taking a really long talk and I'm trying to put it in 35 minutes, so if you can't listen fast, I really apologize. I just completed the Bible here, Father Mike Schmitz, and just so you know, I listened to it on double speed all last year. So if you think that Father Mike Schmitz speaks fast, you ain't heard nothing yet. I want you right now to ask the question, why do people not go to church? We're in the mission of a national Eucharistic revival. In 2019, a study came out that said 70% of Catholics do not believe that Jesus is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. We've epically failed. And I want to say that there's actually worse data than that. And since the National Revival is based off that data, I want to tell you, and I'm a National Eucharistic preacher, that I actually don't think that's the problem. There's a deeper problem. So right now we're going to reveal that problem really quickly. I want you to turn to the gentleman to your left or to your right. I want you to introduce yourself real quick. Ready, go. Okay. Now I want you to turn to that man and I want you to tell him why you choose to go to Mass. What is the reason that you go to Mass? Ready, go. of women you're acting like a bunch of women talking that much so please stop talking I want to prove the fact that the majority of you got that answer actually completely wrong and I'm just gonna prove it right now I've been giving talks all across this country during the National Eucharistic Revival I'm a National Eucharistic preacher these are the top reasons why people say that they go to mass they go to mass for community and for fraternity they go to Mass to hear God's Word proclaimed for sacred scripture. They go to Mass to hear a homily or a sermon. They go to Mass for music. And for those who are really pious, they'll say, I go to Mass to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and the Most Holy Eucharist. All of those answers are absolutely not sufficient. And if you said those answers, you actually don't know why we actually go to Mass. Because those are all fruits of the one main reason that we should be going to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And that is the fact that the Mass is the representation of Calvary. The Mass is the representation of Calvary. The Mass represents the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. That's what the Mass is. And out of that, everything flows. Let me prove my point real quick. Community scripture, homily, sermon, music and reception of Holy Communion? Raise your hand if you've ever been to Mass where you didn't receive Holy Communion. Every hand should be up because at the age of eight you couldn't receive Holy Communion. If you're in the state of mortal sin, you should never receive Holy Communion. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Mass where there's no music. Praise the Lord for that sometimes, right? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been to Mass where there's no homily or a sermon. That's double praise the Lord. <laughs> the reality is, is that you've been to Mass in times where you haven't listened to the Scripture, or the Scripture was proclaimed in another language, and it still counted for your Sunday obligation. There's times where you go to Mass, and you're particularly on vacation, and you want to slide in and slide out, and you don't want to talk to anybody. And in fact, all of those things that are listed off are actually things that can take place better outside of Mass. You want a great community? Join a small group. You want great Scripture? Join a Bible study. You want great preaching? Go to a Protestant church. <laughs> you want great music? Go to Spotify. You want to receive the Eucharist? I'll bring it to you in your house. 
I bring the Blessed Sacrament to people in their home all the time. And I will tell you, those are profound, deep encounters with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So the reality is, if those things are not the Mass, then what is the Mass? I will tell you, if the 70% of people don't believe that Jesus is present, blessed, and sacrament, then I will tell you that 90 plus percent of people have no idea what the Mass actually is. And the Mass is the representation of Calvary. The Mass is the eternal sacrifice of the Lamb of God for your sins, for my sins, that saves the whole entire world. That's what the Mass is. I'm going to take us through a little devotion this morning. I need every man under the age of 20 to stand up. Under the age of 20, stand up. And I need uh, 14 of you to start walking down this way. Just start walking down this way if you're under the age of 14. Under, under the age of 20, just start walking down here. Old men, please push them. <laughs> stand up here on the top step. Tops, I need 14 men. Count yourselves off. 14 men. Once there's 14, go back. Okay. There's clearly more than 14, so we're good. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Get out of here. <laughs> so, my brothers, raise your hand if you've ever prayed the Stations of the Cross. Today you're going to pray the Stations of the Eucharist. Let's take the word station, okay? I want you to think of a railroad track. And I want you to think of a station on the railroad track. That's what a station is. When we think of the Stations of the Cross, it's a journey of Jesus' passion, and there's stations along that journey. Now we're going to talk about the stations of the Eucharist. These are 14 stops on the journey of our Lord Jesus Christ that actually begins in the book of Genesis. Because God's Word in its entirety, from the front cover to the back cover, is about one thing, and that is your salvation. And who is the only Savior of the world? And how did He save you? On the cross, and in an empty tomb. And thus, every single point of the Bible points to the one eternal sacrifice, which is only one, which is the Mass, which He gave to us so that we can enter in again and again and again and again and be present at His eternal redeeming sacrifice. When we pray the Station of the Cross, we say, We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. <laughs> Today we're going to do a little different. We're going to say, O sacrament, most holy, O sacrament divine, and you're all going to say, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. For those of you who have never heard this phrase, it's going to be all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O sacrament, most holy, O sacrament divine. For those of you who are Protestant, you already have your notebook out, your journal, you're ready to go. For those of you who are Catholic, you're just sitting there. If you have a piece of paper, I want you to write these down. If you have a magic phone, which means one of those devices that often leads you into sin, I want you to take it out and I want you to use it for good. And I want you to write these down because I want you to take them to a holy hour because they're going to change your life, but they're also going to change how you celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The first station, the sacrifice of Abel. O sacrament holy, O sacrament divine. Adam and Eve fall into sin. God blesses them with two children. What are their names? And what happens? Cain kills Abel. And we always talk about that. And we talk about brotherly love and how we're supposed to love each other. And that was the first murder. But we, 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 we always forget to answer the question, why? Why did Cain kill Abel? Out of envy. But then we don't even ask the question, why of that? What caused the envy? The envy was the fact that Abel offered a sacrifice and Cain offered a sacrifice. What did Cain offer? Vegetables. What does God not want? See, your mom was wrong the whole time. God doesn't accept the vegetables. What does God accept? He only accepts one sacrifice. And what sacrifice does God accept? The sacrifice of a lamb. Why does he accept the lamb and not the vegetables? Because the lamb is a prefigurement. The lamb is a foreshadowing of the only sacrifice that God will receive for the salvation of mankind, which is a lamb. We are saved by the blood of a lamb. And that is what ultimately brought about the death of the first human being. It was a misunderstanding about what an appropriate sacrifice is. How many people spiritually die because they don't know what the sacrifice of the Mass is? Countless. The second station, O Sacrament Holy, O Sacrament Divine. 
The second station is Melchizedek. Melchizedek was this great priest who shows up out of nowhere. He was a king and he was a priest. And he offered a sacrifice of bread and wine. A king and a priest who offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. This is important because Jesus is a king and a priest who offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. But that's not just why it's important. It's important because Melchizedek was not from the tribe of Levi, which hadn't even come about yet. But once the 12 sons of Jacob are established, only one group of people are allowed to offer sacrifices. Only one group of men are allowed to be priests, and those are the Levites. And what tribe was Judah from? I'm sorry, what tribe was Jesus from? He was from the tribe of Judah, which means that he can't actually offer worthy sacrifice. But it's clearly proclaimed in Scripture that Jesus Christ is a priest from the order and the line of who? Melchizedek. Which means that he starts a new priesthood, an eternal priesthood, which allows him to offer a sacrifice of bread and wine. Which I and my brothers stand in the line of. The third station. Osak, most holy Osak, the divine. The third station is the sacrifice of Abraham. Now, once again, there are 30 connections between the sacrifice of Abraham and his son Isaac and the sacrifice of God the Father and his son Jesus. 30, 30 direct connections. And I'm going to tell you, we can get lost in that and actually forget why this biblical passage is so powerful. God asked Abraham to do one thing. What did God ask Abraham to do? To kill his son. And then an angel comes and stops Abraham. But just because the angel stops Abraham doesn't mean that a sacrifice is not demanded. Abraham knows that a sacrifice is demanded. So what does Abraham do? He sees a lamb caught in a thicket. What's a thicket? A crown of thorns. He sees a lamb caught in thorns. What lamb do you know that was caught in thorns? And that's called a replacement sacrifice, brothers. The lamb that replaced Isaac, caught in, the, in, in a crown of thorns, was a replacement sacrifice. It replaced his son. Why is this so important? Because Jesus is your replacement sacrifice. Who should have died for every single time that you've lied? that you've stolen, that you've looked at pornography, that you've masturbated, that you've committed adultery, that you've cheated? Who should have died? You. And there is one replacement sacrifice. And it's the sacrifice of Jesus, who dies in our place, as the lamb died in the place of Isaac, crowned with thorns. The fourth station the Jewish Passover. O sac most holy, O sac most divine. You're a slave. You're in Egypt. Moses and God have sent ten plagues, and none of them have convinced Pharaoh. But the tenth one does. What is the tenth plague that is sent? The angel of death comes to kill anyone who does not sacrifice a lamb and do what two things? Two things need to happen. Number one, you need to eat the flesh of the lamb. And number two, its blood has to be on your doorpost. St. John Chrysostom clearly interprets this as the fact that we, we, the people of God, we, the people in slavery, must eat the flesh of the Son of God and his lips must be on our do doorposts. Where are our doorposts? There are lips. On the day of your baptism, you became a temple of the Holy Spirit and there must be blood on your lips. If not, the angel of death will not pass over you. What does Jesus say in John chapter 6? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. He who eats my flesh and drinks the blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. My brothers, the fulfillment of the Passover is the representation of Calvary, which we then enter into in Holy Communion. The fifth station, the man will come down from heaven. O Sacramus, Holy O Sacramus, Divine. <laughs> Gentlemen, raise your hand if you went to a Catholic school. If you went to a Catholic school, it means that you went to either daily mass or at least mass two or three times a week. Do you go to daily mass? Because if you don't, there's a problem. Our Catholic schools have a major problem. They force children to go to school without making the connection to the fact that we're trying to teach them that daily mass is one of the greatest gifts that the church has. Once the Israelites were set free and they were 
in the desert. They were starving to death. They were starving. They were in a world where there was nothing. They were starving. What does God send them? Manna come down from heaven. How often did that manna come? Daily, except for Sundays. But they, they, they gathered twice on Saturday. Well, on Friday, actually. God sent daily bread. Brothers, I want to challenge you right now. Our churches should be packed, just not on Sunday, but every day. If you have never made the commitment to get to daily mass, I want to change your life. I want you to know of freedom, of peace, of joy, and daily mass will change your life. It fed the Israelites, it will feed you. Osakma, the sixth station, Osakma, most holy, Osakma, divine. The Ark of the Covenant. The Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Jesus, sorry, God the Father knew that we as human beings, he created us, he made us, he knows us. And what did he do? He created a place for us to go. He knew that we as human beings have literally a desire to physically go to a place to worship him. So in the Old Testament, they went to one place. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, every Catholic church has an Ark of the Covenant, a place where we physically can go and be with the Lord. My brothers, in my parish assignment right now, I do have four parishes, I have seven churches. In 2017, we opened a perpetual adoration chapel. Please pray for my people. We are opening our second perpetual adoration chapel on February 14th. Why? Because we are dying. We are literally dying as human beings. We need a place to go. We need a refuge. We need a place to know with certitude that we are encountering the presence of God. Every tabernacle of the world should be surrounded by faithful, devout people who love the Lord, who want to waste time. Think of how much time you waste watching sports on your phone. How much would your life, your marriage, change if you wasted time with the Lord? And we have a place to go. The seventh station, Bethlehem. Osakma, holy Osakma, divine. We just celebrated Christmas, a little town of Bethlehem. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the, away in a, what are all these? Well, the word Bethlehem actually translates into house of bread. Jesus was born in a town called the house of bread because he would say, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. He's laid in a feeding trough for beasts, for animals to eat. Who are those beasts and those animals? You and me. And yet when we eat this food of immortality, it changes us. It restores us to who we are called to be. The eighth station, St. John the Baptist. Osakma, holy Osakma, divine. So I just want to tell you, this is the key. This is the key right here. St. John the Baptist is standing at the River Jordan. I want you to realize his cousin, this is his cousin, walking by. Now, John the Baptist could have said anything. He could have said, hey, there's Emmanuel. He could have said, hey, there's the King of Kings. He could have said, hey, there's the Lord of Lords. He could have said, hey, that's my cuz. <laughs> that's what I would have said. <laughs> but he didn't say any of those. What is the one thing that John the Baptist says to point out the Savior, the Messiah of the world. What does he say? He says, Behold the Lamb of God, the only sacrifice that will be accepted. The Lamb of God, the replacement sacrifice for you and me. The Lamb of God, whose body and blood we must consume. The Lamb of God, who every single faithful Jew had been to Jerusalem and had brought a lamb and killed in a Passover and ate his flesh and blood. And every time that there was a sin, every time their child was born, they brought more lambs and they killed them. And now John the Baptist is saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. And everyone would have looked at Jesus. And they said, He's going to die? He's going to replace us? We have to eat him? 
How quickly they've forgotten what the Mass is. Jesus, at the age of 30, goes to a wedding in the ninth station. The wedding at Cana. O Sacrament, Holy, O Sacrament Divine. At the wedding at Cana, the Blessed Virgin Mary looks at her son Jesus and she begs him to turn water into wine. She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. How is it so hard for people to understand that Jesus can turn wine into his blood? And yet there isn't a Christian in the world who would believe that the miracle that took place, the first miracle that took place, didn't happen. Every Protestant in the world believes that Jesus turned water into wine. Why would the all-powerful, almighty God not be able to also turn wine into his blood for you and me out of love to consume, to wash away our sins? Well, he can. And it's a miracle. The tenth station, the multiplication of loaves and fishes, O Sacramos, Holy O Sacrament Divine. Not only does our God have the ability to change substance, he has the ability to multiply substance. He was able to feed a crowd of 5,000 men. And gentlemen, let's be honest, if there were 5,000 men, there were probably 20,000 people there. Look at your churches on Sunday when you go to Mass. Look at the ratio of men to women. Five loaves, two fish. And now Jesus feeds the whole entire world with bread and wine that are brought forward. He multiplies himself to be our food. No longer does he feed the world bread and fish, he breeds the, feeds the world his very self. The 11th station, John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse, O Sac, most holy, O sacrament divine. If there is a Bible passage that you should memorize, it should be John chapter 6. I don't believe in tattoos, I don't think you should get tattoos, but if there's a tattoo you want to get, get a tattoo that says, this is my body given up for you. Because my brothers, John chapter 6 unlocks the truth of who Jesus is and how much he loves you and how he wants you to consume him, to become one with him so you can go out and change the world. You can go out to the peripheries, you can go out and serve in the name of Jesus, with Jesus in your very body. The 12th station, O Sacrament, Holy O Sacrament Divine. Brothers, this is where it all happens. This is what's going to blow your mind. I've been praying to the Holy Spirit. This is where people don't understand what the Mass is. In the Old Testament, the way that you sacrificed a lamb, which Jesus truly is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said it. He fulfills every prophecy in the Old Testament. He is the Lamb. This is how you killed a lamb in the Old Testament. You took a knife and you slit its throat. And the first thing you had to do was pour all its blood out. There was a gutter system in the temple in Jerusalem to take all the blood from the thousands of lambs that were slaughtered. A gutter system only for blood. Because the way that the sacrifice was offered is that, is that the blood and the body had to be separated. What happens at Mass, brothers? Does a priest or a bishop take the bread and take the chalice together at the same time and say, this is my body and my blood given up for you? No, he doesn't say that. That's not how it happens. Jesus took bread and he said, this is my body given up for you. And that bread is then now become Jesus and he holds it up and incense is swung and bells are rung and we adore the body of Jesus. And then he takes a chalice. Then he takes a chalice. Then, separately, and says, this is a chalice of my blood. What do you have? The separation of body and blood. What do you have? The sacrifice. Why did Jesus do this on the night that he was betrayed? To make it evidently clear that he was giving us access to the one perfect sacrifice that he would offer the following day when he would offer his body and his blood on the cross for you and for me. When he would be the Lamb of God and he is now the Lamb whose body and blood has been separated and we are able to enter into it with a priest who offers bread and wine in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just the fact that we go to Mass to eat his body and blood, that his presence is there. It actually is the same redeeming one perfect sacrifice. And there is only one perfect sacrifice, but he gives us access to enter into it. That's why we go to Mass. 
And if that is true, if it is true, if it is true that every single Mass is the representation of Calvary, then bring out music, bring out preaching, bring out a beautiful church. And dear Lord, I want to receive you because I want to be one with you on the cross. I want to stand with Mary and John under the cross. I want to see the blood pouring from your body and fall into my face because we're there. Because it's real. The 13th station, the road to Emmaus. Take a second. Osak, most holy Osak, my divine. If you don't know the story, you should. It's Easter night, two of Jesus' disciples, many theologians believe this is a husband and a wife, are turning their backs on Jerusalem. They're walking away. They encounter Jesus. Jesus begins to talk to them, but he's disguised. They don't recognize him. He began going through the scriptures. Now, my brothers, I tell you, what scriptures is he going through? You have it right here. The Bible says that he goes and he begins to reveal to them who he is. Who is he? He's the sacrifice of Abel. He's Melchizedek. He's the replacement sacrifice of Abraham. He's the Jewish Passover. He, what's he revealing? The plan of salvation. And then it says that they urged him to stay with him. And that when they were at table, he took bread and he broke it. And then they recognized him. Where did they recognize him? They recognized him in the... Okay, brothers, are you ready for this? At every single Mass, bread is consecrated separately from the wine. As a sacramental representation of the death of our Lord, when does the host get broken? After the Our Father, the priest takes the host in his hands. He takes the host and he breaks it. And then he takes a piece of that host and he breaks it off. And he puts it into the chalice. What do you have now? You have body and blood coming back together. What do, you, what, 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 what do we call that? It starts with an R. And as that happens, as we recognize him in the breaking of the bread, as we recognize the resurrected Lord in the breaking of the bread, my brothers, what do we happen to be chanting? Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Fulfillment of the, la fulfillment of the Lamb of Abel. You take away the sins of the world. Fulfillment of the Lamb of Abraham. Fulfillment of the Lamb of the Passover. Fulfillment of the Lamb of God that John spoke of. Resurrected Lamb of God who showed up at Emmaus. And what do we have right there? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What does the priest then do? He takes the host in his hands. He holds it up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. You see, my brothers and sisters, the 14th station is the wedding feast of the Lamb. Take a step forward there. Is the wedding feast of the Lamb. O Sacrament, Holy, O Sacrament Divine. You see, my brothers, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the entire book of Revelation, is showing you and showing me that God ultimately wants to espouse his church. He wants to marry his church. He wants to become one with his church. And it is the triumphant Lamb, the resurrected Lamb who is still slain, but is resurrected. When he shows up in the upper room on Easter night, he still has the wounds in his hands. The lamb who is slain wants to marry you and me. Gentlemen, there's a lot of men in this church that have got a lot of white hair. And many of you have buried your wives. Some of you are children. The majority of us are parents. And what is our hope for them? That they are in the wedding feast of the Lamb. That they see God face to face. 